Welcome back folks, it is me Matimus and I really appreciate you stopping by on today's video. Hope you're having a wonderful day. We are discussing some more military aviation today and specifically the rotating blade from above air type. Uh, yes, the gorgeous attack helicopter gunships of the United States military known as the AH-1 Cobra. An absolute beast of an aircraft that has really served its time over and over again and it's time to really give this aircraft a bit of a showcase and to start looking at how this thing came to be, why it is so successful and why today it is still operating so well. So let's be honest here folks, when you look at this aircraft most people, if you're old enough or even know much about military history, would be aware that this aircraft really hit the spotlight when it came to the Vietnam War. Of course the beautiful UH-1 Huey really required some protection when flying along the jungle terrain and getting shot at from left, right and centre. Now of course the Hueys could defend themselves with their own rocket pods, cannons and door gunners but it wasn't enough to get in and out of close air support strike missions without being shot at from a long distance or even short distance with the slow maneuverability that those aircraft had compared to the beautiful Cobra. Manufactured by Bell Helicopters, the AH-1 Cobra was developed in the 1960s as an armed complement to help out those beautiful Hueys. The Vietnam War really did see the birth of air cavalry, as helicopter-borne troops would fly across the country from battle to battle. As the use of air cavalry continued, it became clearer that armed escorts were required for troop transports to provide as much firepower as physically possible to place onto the enemy to cover the troops getting on and off of those beautiful helicopters and into an environment which is constantly filled with 360 degree attacks. Bell built off the Huey design and platform, and after several different design variations, the helicopter gunship known as the AH-1 Cobra entered service in June 1967, then called the Huey Cobra. The single-engine, twin-blade attack helicopter aircraft served as the main attack helicopter for the US Army until it was replaced by the AH-64 Apache. However, updated versions continue to fly for other nations and for the United States Marine Corps today. On September the 7th, 1965, Bell Helicopters flew the prototype Model 209 attack helicopter which was a private venture to address the US Army's need for this dedicated aerial gunship. The troop transport Hueys, which debuted in 1959, really did revolutionise Army air mobile strategy, but were too large and slow for the attack job and they really needed to get these aircraft out as quickly as possible. They were rushed to service quicker than you can say. Cobra. I'm not going to lie to you folks, they literally built these things off the line, shoved them on a ship, and made them on the ships. Yes, they actually assembled them on the aircraft carriers to try and make sure they could get them out as quickly as possible, which was fascinating to me because for something that's like an aircraft, you really would think that it'd be fully tried and tested, uh, you know, even flew onto the aircraft carriers prior to flying out, but no, they were actually assembled on the aircraft carrier straight into combat. There was no messing around, no trialing, no testing. They were off the production line, on the ship, and off they went, which was rather shocking to me, but made complete sense for the Vietnam War. One month after Bell Management approved the program, the production began at the company's plant in Fort Worth, Texas. The prototype was completed in seven months, borrowing the Lycoming T-53 engine, rotor, and tail of the aircraft of the UH-1, but its two-man crew seated in tandem in a novel sleek fuselage a very sleek fuselage, which helped it to produce a lot of speed, a lot of maneuverability, absolutely perfect for producing cast missions on target and very, very effectively, but at the same time pulling out of the danger zone from ground attack. The prototype had a retractable landing gear to increase speed, however later on it was found that the retractable landing gear really wasn't suitable for landing on and off aircraft carriers all the time and some of the rougher terrain that was seen in Vietnam. Of course, the skid pan that you see on the Cobras nowadays is pretty much standard for all aircraft. The Army picked the Bell submission over the Boeing, Vertol, Cayman, Pixaki, and Sikorsky prototypes and originally designated the new aircraft as the UH-1H Huey Cobra. In recognition of the helicopter's attack role, the designation was changed to AH-1G. Amazingly, between 1967 and 1973, more than 1,100 of these aircraft were built for the United States Army and Marine Corps. Some 300 of these aircraft were sadly lost in combat and in some accidents. They remained in service with the Army until replaced by the beautiful AH-64 Apache, but they do still serve with the Marine Corps, which has continued to upgrade them to the UH-1 and AH-1 aircraft variations. The Marines originally used the single-engine G model, but transitioned to the twin-engine J model. 
The Marines have continually upgraded both Huey and Cobra aircraft and have fielded the UH-1Y and the AH-1Z versions. One of the most important features of this aircraft is the streamlined shape and lighter weight, and the original version had a top speed of nearly double that of the transport helicopters that it escorted. This gave it the maneuver firepower to be able to get anywhere it needed to be, support its troops and pull back out again. This also allowed the aircraft to carry a lot more firepower and ammunition and stay on station longer with the fuel that it was provided with. They were extremely maneuverable, allowing it to go through some of the nastiest environments in the jungle terrain slash mountainous terrain of Vietnam, and still to this day that is applicable with the Afghanistan mountains, using these kinds of helicopters is very very key when trying to get into remote locations which require very very quick casts, but at the same time being able to pull out of the area without having to worry about ground fire. Now, in terms of firepower, under the nose was a turret, and the turret was quite unique to this aircraft. Very new system, very new design. Very similar to what we see in the AH-64 Apache and other more modern day helicopters, the Cobra really was one of the staple designs where it came to introducing this technology and learning how to incorporate both cannon, gun, um, you know, rockets, hellfires, tow missiles, all these systems started to come into play with the optically tracking helmets that were coming into the technology at that time. Of course, multiple configurations of firepower could be put on this aircraft from cannons to guns to miniguns, rocket pods, tow missiles, everything you could think of. Enough to put enough cast down to really make a bad day of anyone on the ground. But primarily its focus was infantry assault in the Vietnam era. It wasn't really focused on the anti-tank warfare side of things until later on in the Cold War where the tow missile system was actually brought into play and interestingly enough I found out that the helicopter had to be placed in a certain position or flight mode to allow it to launch that tow and be in a perfect level playing field. That was interesting to me because I thought, you know, technology really wasn't quite there to allow that capability to prevent launching a bad missile or a bad uh, weapon system. But yes, even in, when the first tows came out, the systems they had in place, the fail safes, allowed the gunner um, to launch the missile effectively without the pilot ruining his shot, which, you know, really wouldn't be a good day. Under the nose was the turret that could mount miniguns, cannons, or those grenade launchers. The turret could pivot to both sides of the helicopter as well as up and down. The turret was controlled by the gunner seated at the front, and also the pilot with the rear could also fire the turret. It was locked also in a fire forward position, which allowed it to basically turn into an A-10 Thunderbolt. The 20mm cannon on the front of the gunship was basically turning anything in front of it into mincemeat. However, the primary focus was to use the gunner to support it in a 110 degree axis left to right. Not only did this support the troops on the ground, it was a very good visual reference for the pilot and the gunner inside the aircraft. Of course, there was the anti-tank capability that the aircraft started to look into further into its service history, and the tow missile and Hellfire missile really came into play with this aircraft very, very well. Anti-tank capability really stepped into play a lot more for the Cold War, and of course, the Vietnam era really didn't see much in terms of anti-tank, uh, you know, warfare or engagements when it came to use of this aircraft. The Cobra could carry 1,360 kilograms of weapons on each of its stub wings. Early production helicopters were fitted with up to four pods of 70mm unguided rockets. Transitioning further into this aircraft's history, the United States Marine Corps, in need of a similar attack helicopter system, took interest in the Cobra and evaluated the AH-1G model for its own purposes. This led to a 1968 order of 49 helicopters in the twin-engine AH-1J Sea Cobra. The primary difference being the installation of a Pratt & Whitney Canada T400 WV402 turboshaft engine of 1800 shaft horsepower. Two PT6 turboshafts mated through a single transmission system were installed on the aircraft. The Chin turret M197 housed a Gatling style 20mm cannon unlike the combination turrets of the US Army mounts. The design eventually spawned the much improved AH-1W Super Cobra line. While Lockheed AH-56 Cheyenne program sputtered and eventually fell to naught, the Bell Huey Cobra made itself a long-lasting legacy with showing its Vietnam conflict hero status. It became the staple of the US Army and US Marine Corps service for decades to come and still to this day, and was further pressed in action during the notable American military commitments of the 1980s in Panama and the 1990s in Operation Desert Storm along with Haiti and Somalia. The loss of the AH-56 was lessened some by the arrival of the Hughes AH-64 Apache series, which really was a truly dedicated anti-armor solution for the Cold War, and this helped the line reduce the army reliance on the AH-1 moving forwards. 
The US Marine Corps, however, still favoured their beautiful AH-1s and chose to consistently upgrade the types and meet the demands for the modern battlefield. This brought in the AH-1W Super Cobra and the modern AH-1Z Viper. Ex-Army AH-1s were passed on to the American allies around the world while some were retained by the US government for firefighting services. The effectiveness of the AH-1 in war environments helped to push its value as an export product and a select group ultimately took the type into inventory in Israel, Japan, Jordan, Pakistan, South Korea, Spain, Thailand, Turkey. Israel's AH-1s were eventually replaced by AH-64s in time and served with the Israeli Air Force for quite some time. While the Japanese AH-1S models are manufactured under license through Fiji Heavy Industries from 1984 to 2000. In all, there proved to be quite a few different variants after the original Bell 209 prototype and the initial AH-1G production models. The AH-1Q of 1973 became the interim anti-tank model supporting the tow anti-tank missile system with improved cockpit weapon systems. Some 92 AH-1G models were converted to the Q standard. There are a lot of different variants of this aircraft, from the AH-1MC, AH-1S MOD, AH-1P, AH-1E, AH-1F, the list goes on. But some of the big features that really upgraded and changed this aircraft were things like introducing more improved armoured cockpits, uh, low altitude flight systems, composite based rotor assemblies, four bladed rotor assemblies, um, more improved armament systems, which included the M197 20mm 3 barrel chin cannon. Um, modernized Cobras also had a specific laser rangefinders, IR jammer equipment, digital dependency systems, heads up displays. Uh, there was huge upgrades placed on the you know aviation systems on these aircraft to make them even more maneuverable. You've got to remember that with modernization of these aircraft, more heavy equipment's been placed on there. Heavier weapon systems, Hellfires are not lightweight, folks. They require, you know, more targeting systems. So the more strain you're putting on those engines, they're looking into try and reduce elsewhere. So they're trying to make the aircraft lean, but at the same time improve its overall features, which can be very hard to do. Twin engine variants evolved along their own line beyond the original AH-1JC Cobra and included the AH-1T improved C Cobra. Also, the AH-1W Super Cobra and the AH-1Z Viper, which were now all very common to see on the battlefields in Afghanistan. The Super Cobra first flew in 1969 and was introduced in 1971 with the Marine Corps of the United States military. Over 1,270 of this line were built overall. The ultimate Cobra attack form is in the Viper system, which entered the US Marine Corps in 2010. And still to this day, it just looks amazing and really does set, I guess, the cherry on top of the ice cream that is the legacy of this aircraft. Seeing this beautiful aircraft still flying uh, as a, a helicopter gunship and support helicopter for close air support for Marines on the ground, I'm sure many Marines will testify to say that they really want this thing on their side. You know, the Cobra is really, I guess, sidelined a little bit compared to the Apache gunship, which is a little sad considering the service history of this aircraft and how capable it still is to this day. But, you know, I think that's just part and parcel. You know, the Apache has got the persona and the image of, you know, the movies that are out there. A lot of people don't know of the history of the Cobra. They see the Apache, they know it's this massive tank killer of the Cold War. For those older folks out there who know of the Vietnam, conflict and know of the capabilities of the Cobra and how well it supported the Hueys, I really do feel like that the Huey should be in the spotlight more than the Apache is, because it really can do just about what the Apache can do, just a lot nimbler. Um, but that's just my own personal opinion, it's subjective to everybody else's sort of uh, bias on whether they like the Apache or the Cobra. But let's just all come to the common agreement here that the Cobra has served its time extremely well. It did very, very well in Vietnam. It probably saved a lot of lives for the US military. And I'm just really glad to see it still being used today. And I have spoken to people in the US Marine Corps who have had these aircraft serving alongside them and have the utmost respect for them. So let's hope they continue serving for a lot longer, and I'm sure they will. A lot of money's been pumped into these aircraft, but just like the A-10, folks, there's always going to be an end line, an end limit to how long a airframe is going to stay in the skies. The things that really stand out for me for this aircraft is the twin engine capability on a very slender fuselage, which provides a lot of torque and a lot of lifting power to give a lot of extra firepower when necessary and to stay on call. There's no point having close air support that has all this firepower 
blowing its load at once and not having the fuel to even provide reconnaissance or support visually to the troops on the ground. It's not always about the rounds going down range, folks. Sometimes it's just nice to have a little bit of air support to see what's going on. And I think a lot of people are quite blinded to the fact that yes, gunships are there to put rounds down range, but they are also there to scout out enemy positions, provide da battle damage reports, you know, all these kind of things that I think a lot of people don't realize that these kind of aircraft can provide. Apache longbows, of course, have so much capability, but they are really a tank killer at the end of the day. And I find that the Cobra really is the more nimble, um, I guess, cheaper option than having to pull in full Apache longbow radar guided systems that are a little OTT than, you know, some of the conflicts and battles that we're seeing nowadays. But anyway, folks, I am very, very uh, glad to see this aircraft still flying, and I hope it continues service well into the future. Any US Marine Corps uh, troops that are serving veterans have served with it or know of it, please let me know your experiences with it. I'd love to hear about it and I'm sure many of my viewers and subscribers would too. Please leave me a comment. I'd love to hear your opinion on it. I hope you enjoyed today's video, folks. I'd really appreciate it if you could leave me a comment, uh, even if you didn't like it or things I can improve on. And if you want to support my channel, please go check out my Patreon page. It is in the link box below, so you can go support my channel if you want to. And thanks to everyone who already has or wishes to in the future. So, also, hit that little bell button by the subscribe button if you want to be notified of any upcoming military review videos. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. All the best. Bye-bye.